we're going to do a brief introduction now and spend most of our time up in the orchards up above. So um, here we have Mr. Orrin Martin, who has been managing the Chadwick Garden for over 35 years. And he um, teaches over 30 apprentices every year how to do all things gardening and specifically around fruit trees. He's taught a number of apprentices, gone on to be orchardists themselves, including Matthew Sutton here, who runs Orchard Keepers, an orchard and garden care business in town, and um, employs a number of other people, such as myself, who um, I'm a student of Orrin's, I did the apprenticeship in 2010, stayed on a second year um, in 2011, and now I work for Matthew Fruiting Trees around town. So, It also should be noted that she and a fellow former apprentice, uh, who also works for Matthew, Sky DeMuro, have been uh, managing Everett Family Farm out in yes. San Jose Road in South Cal for the last couple of years. And that is an amazing farm. I'm Zoe, sorry. Okay, so, um, uh, like Zoe said, today we're going to be talking uh, poem fruit and primarily looking at pruning of poem fruit and then uh, more primarily looking at apples. I don't know if we have any pears left around here. Uh, so we'll be looking at apples from year one of planting to some wild old trees uh, in the orchard. Um, we'll be walking up to the orchard here in a second and uh, a brief overview and then we're going to break up into two groups um, and so we can have nice small groups looking at the trees. Um, so this class is put on through the Friends of the Farm and Garden. How many people here are a friend of the Farm and Garden? Oh, wonderful. The rest of you can become our friends. Uh, here is the little envelope. And uh, all you need to do is uh, put some money in it, a uh, check or cash, whatever. Um, $30 is an individual membership um, uh, a minimum. And uh, what do you get? You get 10% off uh, discount um, of the Friends Merchandise and Plant Purchases, um, subscription to quarterly news and notes, discounts at two local nurseries, uh, Sierra Azul and ProBuild. And uh, free entry to the Harvest Festival, a whole bunch of stuff. And also, early admittance to our two plant sales uh, in May and in September down at the uh, uh, Barn Theater parking lot. Because it can get pretty ugly down there. you got to get there early. <laughs> plant, people are fighting over those plants. So, yeah. Uh, and so uh, sign up and then the best of it if you do sign up to become a friend you are supporting this um, farm which has been kind of pioneering the whole movement of sustainable agriculture for over 40 years. That's the friends and so the friends support the farm and the apprenticeship here and then also throughout the year um, we're looking to support our community with various horticultural uh, uh, related classes. Um, throughout the winter here's uh, this nice um, salmon colored sheet. I hope you all got it. This gives the layout for the remaining classes for the uh, winter fruit tree and blueberry workshops. Uh, we hope to see you. Um, Orrin's going to say, uh, uh, say a little bit about um, next week's class, but then uh, the week after that we have, um, if you guys have a bunch of stone fruit, that is anything with a pit, plums, peaches, nectarines, apricots, um, come to that class and we'll go over all of the ins and outs of pruning those trees. Um, and then we're doing a, a fun grafting class uh, looking at March 8th. Um, so if you're interested in learning how to graft, um, either uh, rootstock, bare root rootstock, um, or graft onto an old existing tree you have, come on over. Uh, we'll show you those techniques and then you will leave with a grafted tree as well. It should be real fun. Um, <clears throat> so, and then as always, uh, if you, you all have uh, anything of interest uh, that um, you're looking to learn in, terms, in, in the world of gardening and horticulture, let us know about these topics because we have a, a huge pool of resources up here, uh, very knowledgeable people to then put um, certain different classes on the calendar. Um, so you can just talk to one of us or talk to uh, any of the volunteers up at the front desk. Would you keep trying Kwam? <laughs> poem, yeah. Uh, well, it means apple in French, um, but what we're looking at, poem fruit, is kind of a category for pears and apples, quince. Um, there are some quince we could look at, but who's here growing a quince? Oh, look at you, okay. Uh, we can do that, uh, look at those, um, but primarily they're all going to follow the same basic principles um, of, from each other.
So I, I just wanted to promote the next weekend's the 8th and 9th uh, fruit tree and weekend. weekend. Uh, Zoe, the aforementioned uh, Sky, and myself will be your instructors. And today you're going to listen to us and watch us. Next week you're going to listen to us and watch us, and then you're going to do it. Hit everything from start to finish. So this will be on uh, selecting what's a quality tree, site, soil, uh, some soil analysis, some easy techniques visually you can use as well as laboratory analysis, um, uh, planting, carrying the yearly cycle of growth and tending the trees. And this is at the Chadwick Garden. We have a range of trees from just planted yesterday to 30 years old and a range of rootstocks and uh, tree training forms, uh, some of which we know after we here today. Uh, and we'll run you through the, kind of say, in a weekend, the almanac of the fruit. Uh, it's very fun. We've done this for three years or so. Uh, and it operates in the same fashion that our apprentice pro six month apprentice program here does, which is kind of the buzz phrase would be something to the effect of I do, we do, you do. <laughs> Works pretty well. Uh, here, let me tell you some stuff. Let me show you some stuff. Okay, let's do some stuff together. I'm being articulate when I say stuff here, but nonetheless. Uh, okay, you do yours a little and I'll do mine and then we'll check back in. And, uh, uh, so if you're really wanting to get a little more of a feel in a story sense, come on out. We still have a few openings, I think. Uh, sign up. That's the deal. And then, can I go over there? You have, and, and these, actually I saw people thumbing through their handouts. The workshop flyers are at the entry table where you pay, or at least hopefully you pay. Um, and then uh, on the table by the gatehouse here are a series of handouts. Th articles like these articles are what you will get as part of your quarterly newsletter if you become a friend of the farm and garden and other stuff. Um, uh, but I just wanted to just highlight these here. You have one entitled Apple Trees for Every Garden. And this is just an introductory thing to growing apples. And poems, as someone was asking, as Matthew was defining apples and pears principally, but quinces too. And, but basically, here's the deal. Anything you can or should do to an apple, you can and should do to a pear. They are in their physiology, growth patterns, the way you treat them, the way they respond, identical. So when we're saying apples, you could substitute pears. Quinces, well, my wife is an elementary school teacher, and in the teacher's trade and the jargon, uh, they have what they call conduct disorders. And she has always noted I was probably one. Um, sometimes she doesn't use the past tense. Um, uh, and uh, quinces are conduct disorders. <laughs> They're going to do what they want to do, despite what you want them to do. Uh, but there are the same principles apply to pruning them, except there's one big difference which is they bear on new wood, so you have to prune them a little differently. But there are some in the farm garden if there's time and, and, and people are interested, perhaps we could visit them near the end. So you have apple trees for every garden and overview. I think what's of value in this is there's a chart on page two that's rootstock types and characteristics. So uh, we'll talk more about that as we go, but basically the main contributor of the rootstock is to grow tree size. And I would encourage you to grow the size manageable tree, let's say eight to 12 feet. Um, and then there is an out, uh, overview of the different uh, central leader tree types we'll go over it out here. Probably the most important one you have is choosing and using cover crops in the home garden and orchard. How many people are now presently using cover crops in their growing situation? Okay, the rest of you leave. <laughs> and don't come back till you have pictures to prove that you're cover cropping. Um, it is, uh, it's requisite for sustainable sound growing. And it's uh, an example of using biology to help you. The old Buckminster Fuller, the Renaissance man of the 70s and such, the inventor of the geodesic dome and such, had the phrase, work smart, not hard. I would admit to say, work smart, not so hard. You can use soil biology via cover crops to help you grow in an excellent manner. So we'll start growing up. And then uh, uh, there's one on tools of the trade. We'll go over that in our subgroups, good tools, sources. Uh, a yearly care cycle that Matthew authored here, and then two literally hot off the press, um, one forming uh, uh, a modified central leader with this sweet drawing that a environmental student intern did last summer. 
uh, and the other one is a little broader thoughts on pruning and training uh, and it leads into how to form an open center. The open center and the modified leaders you'll see are the two basic tree forms that we're going to be talking about today. And then before these guys put duct tape over my mouth, I'm going to uh, step aside. <laughs> all right, so if you all would follow us, we're going to head up to uh, the orchard. Pruning is a useful skill, a lot like driving, another useful skill. But if you don't know where you're going and how to get there, it doesn't do you much good now, does it? So where is it that you want, so you use pruning and training to get what you want, to, where you want to be with fruit trees. Um, uh, where is it that you want to be going? As Matthew said, think sunlight. I mean, I'll, there are two principal things in my mind about growing trees that real broad, overarching categories. One is sunlight management, and the other is filling space. How much space do you have to fill? How quickly can you fill it? Because a tree will not bear fruit until it has met all its structural needs. It needs to grow its entire root and shoot framework, and then with reserve carbohydrates, uh, it'll make fruit wood for you. Uh, and the size of your tree, the spacing, the distance between rows is largely determined by the vigor of the variety. A, a Mutsu or a Fuji apple, bullish. Uh, Cox's Orange Pippin, in addition to being exquisite, is weak. So uh, you have some built-in genetic varietal vigor characteristics as per your variety that you're growing. Some are more vigorous, some are less vigorous. And then the dry, that's a secondary effect in tree size. <laughs> the, the driver, the primary thing with tree size is the rootstock. Um, and this may mean nothing to you. As I said, there's a chart. Uh, in your apples for every garden, listing out the different rootstocks and their characteristics. And the main thing you think of when you think of rootstocks is size control. From now there are many dwarf trees that are bred to be at maturation at three to four feet. And then there's the standard, as you see, 100, 125 years old down the power <coughs> uh, in Watsonville, uh, 100, uh, uh, 30 by 40 foot trees. And there's, there are many gradations along the way as per what rootstock you choose. And some of the biggest, most critical mistakes people make with trees is before they even put the tree in it. The last thing you want to do is plant the tree. So I'm selecting what grows well here. Let's say, yeah, apples. Uh, let's say uh, uh, figs. Yeah, moderately so. Uh, so you need to make some good choices there. And then what variety and what rootstock, what size, how much space am I trying to fill? What fits? So you need to do a little homework there. And you need to buy yourself a quality tree. I think somewhere in the course of the dividing you up and such, we'll speak to what's a quality tree briefly. Uh, but so uh, there's filling space. And but the main thing is there's a, uh, a little riff I have, which is uh, uh, it's a fruit grower's pseudo haiku. It's 12 instead of 17 syllables, but no less. The more sunlight you intercept, the more fruit you get. You've got to have. You manage a tree for sunlight. Think of these beautiful creatures, as it were, here as the most efficient solar collectors. And so you want to have a geometry or an architecture or a form to your tree that regardless of the specific tree form you, you go to, and we'll speak to a couple, open center and leader here in a minute, uh, uh, that the branches are projected up and out, that there's good spatial relations, as it were, between uh, branches, that they're spread both horizontally and vertically. Your goal is to project branches up with good leaf surface to intercept a maximum amount of sunlight for photosynthesis. I might add, photosynthesis, the most important reaction on the planet. Uh, and uh, to intercept sunlight, to photosynthesize, the byproduct of photo photosynthesis is, is carbohydrates, mostly sugars and growth hormones that the tree will move around to grow roots, shoot, wood, fruit, variously. Uh, and uh, you could also say that fruit is produced from one source, the sun, which I might add is a nuclear power plant at a safe distance. That would be 93 million miles away. A uh, little editorial comment there. So it's about sunlight. Having enough tree the geometry of which puts branches out so that they're not over one another, crossing one another, shading one another. Again, good 
horizontal and vertical spacing to intercept light. That's one aspect of fruit growing in terms of sunlight management. Capture it. To grow the tree, grow fruit. The other aspect which is equally important is sunlight infiltration or sunlight distribution within the canopy. Those aforementioned beautiful 30, 40 foot, just marvelous trees in Watsonville are just that, big marvelous inefficient trees that having sunlight distribution into the core. What are they good for? Putting a swing on them, putting your kid on the swing, sitting down in the shade, reading a racy novel. Yeah but not so good as fruit producers. If you look at the big old tree like that, the outer part of the shell, 20%, gets adequate sunlight. Sunlight doesn't travel into a tree more than three or four feet unaided. What you're doing with pruning and trading is aiding sunlight shafts or chimneys of light into the lower and the interior portions of the tree. So the big old Watsonville tree, the outer 20% of the clam shell, beautiful fruit, big fruit, a lot of fruit. You come in the next 20%, yeah, you got some fruit and it's kind of okay and it tastes pretty good. And then and in some instances the interior 60% of the tree doesn't not only does it not have enough light to support fruit growth but not even enough to support leaf growth. It's bare wood. I jokingly call that the zone of firewood production. <laughs> it's nice but uh, so uh, so you want to create a tree that has Sun, so sunlight can enter into the tree. Open center uh, is composed of uh, a tree structure that has a wide open, think of a cone, <coughs> wide circular opening at the top and a narrow base. This is what you're trying to achieve with your training and pruning. So you have a wide open space there that allows sunlight to tumble down into the center. Think of this tree form as a, this is a joke, think of this tree form as a sun cup. Fill your cup with sun, fill your life with fruit. There it is. Um, but it's true, it's about sunlight management. 80% direct sunlight, striking a branch to manufacture and maintain fruit wood. So as a fruit grower, whether it's avocationally or vocationally, you're just so hawk-eyed about, is there enough light, is there enough light? At this time of year, we find plenty of light because <clears throat> by and large, the trees are dormant and leafless. Oh well. Uh, it's about, the summertime when they're leafed out and the time you want to look at your trees to evaluate them. In the, it's a bit of a crapshoot now. You know, I think I got too much light, I'll thin this out, I'll open this up here. It might be true. But if I go out in the growing season, middle of, I go out late morning, noon and mid-afternoon, I see, do I have enough sunlight down in the interior? If I don't, in real time, I'll just thin some branches to open up the shafts or chimneys of light into the center of the tree. And you can actually take a real cheap photographer's light meter and measure light in that regard, 50 to 80 percent. Or it's just like, kind of like muscle memory with surfing or golf. Sunlight and distributing sunlight. It's about filling space as quickly as you can. There's no right or wrong, but if I put a tree on a rootstock that'll give me a, a 30-foot tree, I don't want them five foot apart. So you mix and match. Spacing, space available, spacing between trees, size of tree, I recommend an 8 to 12 tree match. There are two okay, types of pruners inherently. <laughs> Uh, uh, whackers and haircutters. Just a quick one. Is that still true if you have a small yard and you're trying to grow trees intensively? Should you still? I'm like, it, I planted a bunch of trees last winter. So should I be pruning now or? You prune almost exclusively with winter pruning, invigorating heading cuts. We'll cover in a minute until the tree is established. And you might use a few thinning cuts. And then you, when the tree has reached the size you want, you use summer pruning to keep it in its allotted space. That's usually, you might do some light uh, uh, summer pruning in year two, three with just a few wayward branches. Or when the tree, it doesn't matter what size it is, but when it's mature. Okay. Doesn't matter if it's this big or 30 feet tall. If you take tons of notes and if you don't sit down when you get home and try to read your hand, right? And decipher it and kind of recategorize it, it's not into the ether, just like that. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, I was telling somebody earlier, uh, my wife Stephanie uh, uh, really nailed it a few years ago. She said, Here's the deal, Orrin. You only get one chance a year to get good at winter pruning. Radishes. You can sell radishes every week. Or you can, there are many gardening acts, dig a bed, make a compost, and you get repetitive opportunities in a season and a year. You get one. So the learning curve is a little slower sometimes. And what really 
seals the deal is if you stay in one place with a set of trees and you get a little education and guidance and you start doing it and then you see again it's this call and response this is what i did okay well that's what the tree did based on that here's i'm coming back with this like your trees yeah. tell them about your trees well we planted trees two years ago and uh, uh, that's only trees. how only two only two. Oh my goodness yeah and we, and we did a really good job with the soil but um, they're huge now i'm, I'm yeah, they're she's uh she and her husband have the, I don't know, maybe 20 fruit trees, mixed fruit trees yeah. here, up yeah. in Felton. I've been up a few times, and, and and a lot of times, quite frankly, when I'm driving up to a job, it's like, let's see, <laughs> what can I do? <laughs> uh, but I got out of the car, and I was just like waxing for a beautiful tree. So, uh, but, and so we've been pruning them summer and winter a little bit together, and, and it's a dialogue. It's not just me, I don't know, back and forth, and then, it's like they're getting it because of their, there's an old adage too, it's the best fertilizer, there's an old Chinese farming adage, uh, the best fertilizer is the footsteps of the farm. You go out, you look, you see, and you draw from your observations, you assimilate that, and you come up with an action plan. So, but really, being with a set of trees over a period of time will really quicken your learning. That's the importance of sunlight management in the two aspects of capturing and distribution. Now, that's you can prune trees to the nth degree of exquisiteness. And if you're not attentive to soil health, soil fertility, water, weed control, pests and disease, it's not all for naught, but you still don't have an optimal thing. So about five or six major tenets that you need to attend to. But, but, but pruning can also help you with other is issues like diseases and pests and stocks. Principally M26 and uh, M7, which are in your apples for every garden and the description of their qualities is listed there. Uh, but yes, semi-dwarf, uh, like that. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's just, again, how do you want to fill space? How much space do you have to fill? I am done with ladders. Uh, we've been working with some of the bigger trees to bring them down. And I've got a new edict here, which is uh, the five-foot rule. Nobody, I'm looking for five, six-foot ladders. Uh, only find eight foot ladders. Nobody goes above, you know, paint the fifth step red. Nobody goes above the fifth step. And I'd prefer to be on the fourth step, and I'd prefer to be on the ground. And to get is Felco. You want to bypass Lopper, you see how this blade bypasses this blade here? Rather than uh, uh, the other type is an anvil. I have a flat blade here, and you put the stem in there, and you crush it. And it's really hard on the healing process of the cut. So bypass shears. And Felco is the brand of choice. As I've tried all the rest, this is the best by far. There are a whole, there are eight or 10 or 12 different models in the Felco line. I prefer the number twos. Uh, definitely for trees, they're a little, uh, you know, uh, if you have an infected branch, when you make a cut, you cut into clean wood, but you also disinfect your shears between each cut. Uh, and you can simply use uh, bleach. Uh, in, in water, and that works. Uh, when Matthew uh, first started doing this, he got those little baby wipes, you know, nice, But if you have disease that you're afraid of it, your tools in the back will generally, you know, disinfect. So you do want to keep clean. First, uh, all the rest of the tools I'm going to show you are from this really great, uh, company up in uh, uh, San Pablo Ave in uh, Berkeley, uh, HIDA, H-I-D-A tools. They sell Japanese culinary, woodworking, and pruning tools. Do not take your credit card. <laughs> Bankrupt yourself. Take a limited amount of budgeted cash. Uh, they have the best of tools and quite an array of different types of tools. Uh, this is about an $80 pair of loppers. It keeps a sharp edge uh, ridiculously long. Like, I don't even remember the last time I had to quick sharpen it like that. What's important with loppers is that they, they work well and that you have a bumper here. Otherwise, if they don't have a little rubber bumper here, every time you go like this, boom, reverberations up and down, reverberations up and down like that. Uh, these are good. You know, Felco makes an okay pair set. Uh, Corona makes a fair, their upper end uh, $50 plus ones are okay. These heated tools are the best. Uh, another really, ARS carries these and HEDA carries these. A really effective tool. You know, from the ground, 
I can deal with an eight or nine foot tree. Uh, on a five foot up on a ladder, I can deal with a 15 foot tree like that. Um, These don't come uh, in telescopes. They do. They come in a lot of different brands and they have a lot of different features. I don't recommend any, I'm hard pressed to think of any quality telescoping tool. tool. There may be one, but usually there are issues, kinks in the armor, as chinks in the armor as it were. And then if you want to get a little taller, you get six foot tall. Same deal. And then you need to call out the heavy artillery. Uh, this is my favorite tool this day. Uh, uh, and because of the, uh, the handles here, you've got a lot of torque power. I like the rope. I'm... Those rope things I just haven't found to be very accurate and they're really harsh as per the cut they make. You have a saw on them. You can put the saw always them breaks at the end. Yeah. Uh, 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 heat actually makes a pretty good version of those up in, in Berkeley. But this is actually you can get locally at B&B Motors right by General Feed and Seed by Eric's Deli out across from Dominican Hospital there. Costs about 90 bucks to here. You can cut two, two and a half inch wood here at height. Wow. And it's like a hot knife through butter on bigger mm -hmm. branches. And then the, the issue is you, you know, bring it up. Yeah. Yeah. sobriety issues here. You know, you mm -hmm. Cut your loppers to the branch and all that, and steady it, and then I make my cuts mm -hmm. like that. And I, I, I just, I mean, you got, like, we prune those trees over there, those are Mutu apples without using ladders. With these and the six footer like that. And then you want to get yourself a good saw. You can have a fixed rigid blade or a folding saw. And again, the Hita, Hita carries a brand called Silky. They also carry Silky saws at Pro Build on River Street. And it's the best saw you, you'll ever encounter. Uh, and I like this. I don't know how many hundreds of dollars a, a year I've lost in saws left in trees in orchards at jobs, etc. Uh, and uh, I could like my compadres get us holster and a belt, but I don't seem to do it. But what I do with this is I make my cut and I put it in my left front pocket every time and it fits and it's beautiful. And actually, even that little blade, I can cut through some pretty big wood like that. One thing to be careful of with saws, saw blades that are too long and thin, if you're cutting out here, they snap like crazy. So that's a kind of overview of tool. You can get all different types of saws, but I cannot stress enough that you buy a quality upper end version of Hand shears, long arm, saw, loppers, whatever it is. Is the blade replaceable now? Uh, yeah, the blade, you can't sharpen it. If you sh try to sharpen the blade here, you'll be uh, sharpening your stone. Uh, at some point in time, you need to memorize the components of the form. This is an open center tree, it's composed of like that. And it's got to be like second nature. Like, the form. Here's the function of form. It is conforming, not conforming. I can make it conform, or I'm forming it in a constructionist manner. Components of form on an open center, it's, a, it's not a central leader, it's a multiple leader tree. Uh, you have generally three to five, as many as seven primary branches that are spread equally around the 360 degrees of the trunk so that you have good sunlight alleys or shafts getting light down in the center of the tree. Three, four, five, six, seven, there's some variability there. Two, three, four here. Now when I get up here, I got more. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. What happened? I forked in wide a couple times. Let's look at this one over here. Be easy to see and explain. Every tree training form has its pros and cons. Uh, one of the negative things about the positives, emphasize, let's keep on the sunny side. Uh, positive things about the open center tree. It's simple. It's easy to understand the concept, to teach, and to execute. And that's why it was developed. It was developed for large-scale orchards, for quick training of crews, and ease of moving through. Uh, it's, good. it's a good tree. Uh, negatives, it doesn't have as much bearing surface. We're going to look at a leader tree here in a minute. It doesn't have as much fruit-bearing surface, so it bears a little less. So it's not as productive per tree or per area or row or whatever your unit is. Um, so uh, the other thing is that no matter what you do, how well you execute it, over time it tends to umbrella out like this with the weight of the wood and the weight of the fruit. And that will cause shading tree to tree. And also as a branch goes towards flat, it, be, it loses its vigor. Those are negative things. 
Consequently, you have to plant the trees further apart. I know this is close, but further apart in row than you would with what's called a central leader tree that we'll look at there. Um, and if you were to analyze the can bearing canopy, there's just more bearing surface on the leader tree. But it's a beautiful, elegant, and simple form. It's composed of three, five, or seven primary arms. I've, let's just stay up here. So I've got seven extensions. But the way that you compensate for the fact that it doesn't have as much bearing surface is that a couple, here and there where you think you can uh, allow it or afford it in terms of light entry into the tree, you fork or you quiet or you double. It gives you a little more bearing surface. So we did it here. All yeah. branches, whether they're primaries or laterals, should eventually end in a single growth or outlet. You do not want to fork at the very end. Your forking is down here or here or even on a lateral in here but at some point you want to end in a single growth and that's just a real simple trick to allow permanent sunlight into the center. So you start off, you have three to five or seven primaries. And if, you, if I had three, let's say I had one, two, and three, my lateral, so the, the tree is composed of a number of primary scaffold branches, the leader, multiple leaders, primary branches, three, five, or seven. Um, if I have less, say three, the uh, only other component of the tree are what, are what the fruit growers call, especially peach growers call, fruit hangers, laterals. So if I had three, I could have longer laterals, right? But I have seven, so I have shorter laterals. I don't know if that was what you were referring to. You, and let me just also point out and sing the praises of lateral branches. Almost all species of fruit bear almost all of their fruit on laterals. The joke being, laterals are your friends, folks. It's, I have a, my wife and I have a friend, a teacher, resource specialist, uh, junior high school level, and uh, she has these three, two or three beautiful big Santa Rosa plums. A number of years ago, she called me up on a Saturday, such as this in January, and said, Warren, I'm pruning my fruit trees. Good, Marilyn. Okay, I got rid of all that little weak growth, now what do I do? Oh. Savvy crew here. Well, you wait two or three years till your fruit wood uh, grows back and you'll be okay. So, laterals bear fruit. Either with a weaker, lower one. So, uh, let's say that's 20 feet and this is 16 or 15. I come down to the tree, where do I find, and I can't go to something really punky or it overrides it and just jumps. I look for something down and that's canted out and is, as per its expression, weaker. This would be a good replacement leader. I thin to this replacement leader. If I go around the tree, and again, this is not exactly the greatest thing, I would cut to here. I don't have a choice, oh, I have a choice here. Again, this is, I would not do this on the tree, I would do this on the tree. I would cut to here. Sometimes you just don't have good things, two things not to do. Don't cut to a bare stretch, because no matter what type of cut you meant, it, it, make at that point in the height of the tree is going to take off. Just live with it. Don't cut to something that's ridiculously short or punky. It'll just override it. So you look for something that brings you down a bit. Uh, let's do math here. Say you went from 20 to 15 feet. Uh, that's uh, what percent? 25 percent, I think. 20, 25 percent shorter. That's about what you're going to get in any session. Yeah. And, and then, then you wait that? a year or two and, and then, crack it again. Yeah. And then you do no other pruning on that tree, but that type of pruning that year. Okay. There's a rule. There's tons of them. <laughs> uh, there's a rule, and it's not specific. But over a certain number of cuts, you just stimulate a tree. Don't make a ton of cuts on it. Doesn't matter what kind they are. Too many will just just turn the tree into a, a deadwood. So, so come down, look for a, a and, and 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 a suitable replacement that's you know proportionally okay, not too weak, like this. And if it's canted out, that's better because that's going to open up the interior of the tree. And also, upright growth is vigorous and flat growth is fruitful. I don't want this tree to grow anymore. So if I replace it with a branch that's upright, it will grow somewhat. But if I re replace it with a branch that cants out like this, it'll tone it down. And what's the biggest nutrient sink of all? What's going to slow a branch or a tree down from growing? Fruit. So because I have fruit buds here, I can be confident the fruit on this branch will grab the nutrients, sink it down, slow down further. So 
out of sequence, but that's what you do. What kind of question are those? Oh, overstimulate. <laughs> overstimulate. I mean, if I were to cut to a bear section here, I would get five growths that grew ten feet. That's overstimulating. What do I want? I want to make the tree shorter. I cut to a. You need an outlet. You need a shunt. Water and nutrients are going to flow to tips of branches, no matter what. Uh, when you when you prune a tree, no matter how much or what kind of pruning or this or that, the tree is going to try to grow back what you pruned off to get equilibrium as per it's got this root system, wants to have this shoot system. The issue is where, how much, and in what direction will the regrowth be? So if I cut here, I have what's called a vegetative bud, just take off and take off and take off. If I cut here, a branch that's inherently weak and has expressed fruit buds, here, fruit is a nutrient sink, I'm just shunting the energy into a weaker growth and into fruit, it will probably stay where you want it to be. Vertical action, right? And it needs to be supported. What happened here is this bore too much fruit and sagged the leader. And what's going to happen here is what happened there, I told them, you better support that leader, this one right here. Uh, you can see here, it broke because it was bending in the way of the fruit, and now we're having to regrow the leader, which we're doing. If we don't grab a 10-foot T-post there and take a rope and rectify this, and then I would probably pick the fruit off it this year so it doesn't weigh down again, then we're in trouble, huh? Did you just shorten that leader also? I could do a number of things that I'm not going to do right now. <laughs> uh, and I want to show you, it's a bigger tree. So Look at the component. So central leader, <coughs> ten is straight. The central leader tree is composed of tiers of branches. This is one such tier from here on down. It's composed of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven branches. That uh, you could have five, four, five, it could have nine. Again, this is how you stand it. The more branches you have, again, the shorter your laterals are. And we get to cutting here shortly. I'll show you how to make them short at what time of year. Uh, but say we have seven primary branches in the lower tier. The important thing is that they're spread well radially, horizontally. Again, I've got a shaft of light in here. I've got a shaft of light in there. I've got shafts between my branches. So you train them when they're young. If they're not in the right spacing, you, you, you just move them with, you see I've got that, I want, to, I want even though this isn't young, th these two branches are a little too close together. So if I could, and watch me snap, uh, <laughs> if I could spread them a little, oh, it's embarrassing to do. <laughs> Then I can create a bigger shaft of light and stuff. So I'll give myself a B minus on this. Uh, so a tier of branches, three, five, seven, nine primaries. It just about you need good spacing horizontally. On the leader, where you don't have any branches to skip. Now there can be some little fruit branches, but no appreciable branches. And then you begin a second tier of branches uh, higher up. So pretend this leader is ramrod straight, it's up there. I have one, two, three branches in my second tier. So you have a lower tier with a moderate high number of branches. They skip on the leader two, three feet, and in the second tier. Here's the general rule, if you will. You have more branches that are longer in the lower tier less branches that are shorter in the upper tier. So if you took that cone, the sun cup over there, and you flipped it, you would have a round, wide base and a narrow top. We could use the Christmas tree or the triangle reference here. That form gets light down into the center. A tree that's wide at the top and narrow at the base will shade the interior. And then this skip is huge. It's a really excellent way to permanently get sun into the interior. There's a nice, there can be a nice aesthetic to some of these forms, but it's really form influences, drives function. So that's and it's the natural tendency of the tree? You look, you get to know your tree, you see what its natural tendency, or you create it? How? Either or both. 
Okay. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, sometimes you'll get a tree from a nurse and say, oh, percent, yeah, or a leader, yeah, or you have a lot of latitude. And again, the horticultural sensibilities, or, you know, what's your bias? What do you like? What do you think? Mm -hmm. you know? It would seem to me that if you wanted this particular tree to be an open center, and I don't know you'd ever do this because it's great the way it is, the first year you could cut it right there and get rid of that, and then maybe the next year you could cut it there and you got your open center or a couple of years. I don't know that that would kill the tree, but I'm just. Dude's awesome. Going, what? Dude's awesome. The dude is awesome. Oh. Good perception. But there's a little, little, little problem there. So that, this snapped off. We lost it. Got it. So it's not that. The angle at which you want to grow your primary scaffolds on an open center is more like over there, 50 to 70 degrees, because uh, uh, one is just, you need some shade in the interior, so you could get sunburn, bark burn here, uh, like that, and then this is uh, on an open center, a little too flat and weak, it's going to umbrella out, but you could, and uh, we actually did that here. They're all out into the sun. There can be many shafts of sun down here. You can make the argument this is getting a little too complicated down here and if you felt that was the case you could, I haven't just talked about type of cuts, but I could do that same kind of re or cutting the weakness here. Like that. I got a little more sunlight in there. Maybe I don't like this. <coughs> you want to be careful about cutting too much fruit without the tree. Uh, we don't, all, uh, there was an old ag agent, Ron Tyler, who used to come up and advise us when we didn't feel confident enough to do our trees in the 70s. And he was like, well, that's a pretty funky looking thing there. Right? Ah, you don't prune, he was like a John Wayne of fruits. Ah, you don't prune them for beauty, you prune them for productivity. That's a good branch. <laughs> that was pretty much the end of the discussion. Don't let them. Your question is, why won't these... If you have a single bud, it tends to be the term apical dominus schema. It tends to dominate, so it'll grow, and these will be little weak fruit buds. Or if I see there's too strong a growth there, I won't let it happen. I'll just finger through that early. Early in the season, you come out in May and you see unintended growth. Literally, it's fun. You just push them out. How, so. how is that one different than this one? Just This I'm one I cut to two it. opposing buds yeah. instead of two, an underfacing bud. Oh, it works. Okay. <laughs> oh, facing into the side. single bud yeah, right, goes okay. one, double bud goes two. If other things try to happen, you don't let it happen. And it's the opposite of what you might think. The more growth you want, the harder you cut it back into one-year-old growth. Moderate. To I would. There are some other dividends from heading. The standard heading cut in the one-year-old wood. Look here. This was headed and grew, grew well. And behind the heading cut that was made last winter. I got one, two, three, four, five weak lateral branches. You use heading cuts by cutting back into one-year-old wood to get growth. A secondary effect from heading is the formation of lateral or your fruit bearing surface. A tertiary effect is that it thickens and strengthens branches. You see how these branches are relatively self-supporting and strong. This branch was headed here in January of headed here last week, 013, 012, 011, 010, 09, 08, like that. In the course of heading annually, they have become the can they have produced a nice lateral framework. You see this in here in the older wood, your fruit bearing framework, and they have become mechanically strong in South self-supported. So what do you get from heading? Regrowth, branching, which is your fruit bearing surface, and strength, mechanical strength. So you will not, should not have to prop or tie these branches up, even with a fruit, fruit load, they should be strong. You definitely get the dividend of creating mechanically strong, self-supporting branches from heading annually over time. Those are the cuts. We try to grow these trees to articulated forms, the open center and the modified central leader. You need to know the components of form in your various handouts. It's, I go through it and, yeah, we're trying to have a pedestrian orange. So here's how I would prune it. what's called a light leader tip, let's say, because here's the regrowth, here's the growth, enormous. Slightly stimulating cut. 
I don't really want it to get any taller, and it will, but maybe only a foot or so. But and that's what I did to my apple tree in the summer. Mm -hmm. that. Uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. No. Let's finish this up, and then let's All go right. to that because you need to change your thinking. Um, so I have, you know, in order to learn, you have to uh, tolerate mm -hmm. a little ambiguity. Let's say. <laughs> Okay. Uh, uh, um, I'm going to stimulate a little, but not a lot. I'm going to get strengthening. That's important because I do not want this to splay out over time, mm -hmm. particularly in the in-row situation. So I'm aiding myself and keeping it erect. Mm -hmm. And I will develop a marvelous little fruiting framework here. So those things outweigh leaving it alone. The other thing is, uh, let's see if I can find an example. Yeah. When branches end at the end of the growing season, they set a fat terminal bud. Uh, what do we know about fat round buds? They're fruit, fruit buds. Fruit, fruit, fruit. fruit buds. So what's going to happen here? It's going to set a fat fruit and become a serious sagger or mm. snap. Mm. So even though I don't want it to grow, you usually will head a little longer or taller into the life of the tree or the height of the tree than you might think. You fill space, you slightly overfill it, and then you back off. With the next type of cut, next type of cut, which is called a shortening cut, uh, when you cut slightly into two-year-old or older wood, it stops growth. So let's find here because I need to move on. Uh, uh, this is a lateral branch. It could be done on a primary or a la let's do it on this one because you can see it a little better. Uh, a lateral branch. Uh, this is my last last year's growth because I you. Here's an iron clad rule. <laughs> Do not make stimulating heading cuts into lateral branches on apples and pears. By that I mean into one year old wood. Because they'll grow and you'll get a tangled shaded mess. Don't do it. You treat them otherwise with summer pruning, training, <coughs> and the cut I'm trying to explain now I'll call a shortening cut. So when you cut slightly into two-year-old wood, it stops growth. That's called a shortening cut. It's still a type of heading cut, technically, but it's called a shortening cut. So let's just say this is the one-year-old growth. I don't want to stimulate it and grow. I would actually like it to be a little shorter to get a little more light in here. This is an extreme, but I'm just using this as an example. So I cut to a fruit bud or slightly into older wood. Because the top bud is a fruit bud, that just puts the nutrients into that and it doesn't grow. Mm. So if I were to, I don't want to do this quite yet, but when this tree or that tree gets another year or two taller, <laughs> I would say it's too tall, let's shorten it by cutting into some other older wood like that. A shortening cut is when a branch has filled its allotted space, you come out in a row, going too high, you cut slightly into two year older, slightly older, it could be two or three year old. So a heading cut, when you, standard heading cut is when you cut into one year old wood, the more you cut, the stronger the growth. The secondary tertiary effects are secondary lateral fruit bearing surface, tertiary effect thickening and strengthening, self supporting. Shortening cut where you cut slightly into older wood, two year old, three year old wood. You also can enforce that by cutting to an express fruit bud, stops growth. Whatever the reason you want to stop growth, make a shortening cut. You can do it in the summer or the winter. If you make heading cuts in the winter, it invigorates as I've done on way too long. If you make heading cuts in the summer, it stops growth. Summer pruning is used to stop growth. So you'd better be darn sure you want a branch to stop before you summer prune it. You want to invigorate it? <laughs> head it in the winter. You want to stop it? Head it in the summer. There's a fourth and last type of cut. A renewal cut is where yeah, there you go. That's what we did. a branch has grown too long, it's shading another one. Maybe it's not even growing enough. It's just there's something wrong with it. You want to regrow a branch there, but it's either too vigorous or too weak. This was a tree that was totally punky. It wasn't filling space adequately. So I re-scaffolded it. If you look and you see, I, I cut this, this branch was growing in like this. I, I cut to a little stub. I cut to a little stub. I cut to a bigger stub. If you stub back an established branch, let's say older than five years old or five feet tall, to a little four to ten inch stub, it's very non-specific, whack, uh, non-specific. <laughs> it's a renewal cut. The response is this. I did that last year. It grew from here wow. to there. Wow. 
there are some trees in this orchard that are weak. Uh, let's look over here. I, this was a weak one that I just, I'm, I'm renewing this. I cut the established branch framework. This was a leader tree. It had one, two, three, four, five, six, and a leader here. And they were just pathetic. So I actually left one branch a little longer, and this could be referred to as a nurse branch. It's got leaves and stuff, and it kind of feeds the other branches, but that's why the, there's this differential here. But this is an example. It could be 10 inches. It could be 2 inches. I cut a branch back to its stub, you know, and I regrow it. So I did that uh, 10 days ago. I did that 10 days and one year ago here. Come on over. Some I thinned out and some I summer. Here's what would happen if you prune your branches in the summer. These were three equal branches in August. I pruned this one. And, or actually, I, I did it earlier in the spring. But, but, and it grew two inches. I pruned this one in the summer. I didn't prune this one. It grew this much. But I got this and this and this in one year. So this is renewal or rejuvenative cuts if you have to do in this case I chose to do it to the whole tree it might just be a branch you know, maybe at some point in time the branch is right above James's head in the second tier he'll point to it now we'll get too long and sag and shade the branches below it but I kind of like that decade where I had fruit there so instead of thinning it I renew it it's a, like I said and then you will I do this and then students go around and say, let's try to let's renew this. <laughs> it's something that needs to be used judiciously, but it's a valuable tool. So I got I got back to where I wanted to, you know, this is, I'm calling this a one-year-old tree. Sweet. I'm ready to prune it. What are my goals? What, what, the way I would approach the tree is say, what tree form? Central leader as it stands now, if you just wanted to lop this out, you'd have one, two, three, four, five. Example, you could go either way. You know, I'm, I'm a, people tell me I love central leader. So. Well, you've got these two trees, the way they've been pruned, that are kind of branching out. So maybe this one, if you're looking at the overall shape, Nailed it. let's make this one tall, <laughs> central leader. Uh, these so are good can... perceptions, folks. It's, it's, it's not going to umbrella out as much. Uh, so I've got one, two, three, four, five, six primary scaffolds, my new lower tier. They have pretty good spacing like that. We did a little adjusting here and then, oh yeah, when you drive a stake in to tie something down, drive a stake. So I'm gonna train it. Why am I doing this? Not because the stake was driven poorly. To slow, first to slow the most vigorous of the five primary scaffolds and then to move it in that direction. And then I also can just slightly I would just make some slut. Oh, look. Uh, and you want to be this detailed. Let's kind of fill the space a little more equally like that. And so I actually would actually drive the stake properly. And, you know, you don't train a branch like this. If you have a hook, it's going to take off. You train it mid stem or to the base. I'm going to train it to put it a little flatter, a little <coughs> below 45, because I want to slow down. I basically filled my space with this, but I'm going to head it because I want lateral framework and I want branch strength. And I'm just creating a little more shafts of light, shafts of light. In fact, hold that with you, James. Thank you. Just a little more separation here, perhaps. Yeah, I'm get it. <clears throat> so this is where you might use a tie down to get very much <laughs> more specific. I will, a good tie down, just position this like this. Just. And, and grab that one there and move it to you, something to you, yeah. But just, how can I equally spread these branches? The weaker ones, I'm gonna <coughs> let grow free or even move up, and the stronger ones kick down a notch like that. But, you know, <laughs> say close enough for jazz or farm and garden. So, I have rescaffold a weak, unproductive tree. I'm on, uh, we're on the road to recovery here. Uh, and I'm still going to make some pretty stimulating cuts here. This is a little less because, yep, it's stronger. But I'm still wanting to grow, and I want to develop lateral frame, fruit bearing framework in here. And this one I'll prune the most. And this one kind of intermediate, as it were, I guess. Uh, you know, I've untrained them, but you 
That's my drip there. And then I need a long arm pruner. Yeah, it's got taller. I want to form my second tier of branches this year. I need to skip on the leader of a couple feet. So I'm going to make a cut up here. When you make a heading cut on a leader, usually the next half dozen buds down will break. It hooks out this way a little bit, so I'm going to choose the bud going in that direction. Okay. One of the ways you get in trouble is you keep pruning to a bud on the same size, you get that famous stairway to heaven. That Zeppelin thing going on. <laughs> you want to consider the wind, right? Well, that's the other thing too. We have prevailing westerlies, so you might consider that. But in this instance, I'm going to prune to a bud going in that direction. Okay. You, you stay straight by zigzagging. I know that's kind of you have in the wind direction like though. that. So I'm going to go to a bud in that direction. Yeah. But the lead bud will grow the most, and then the next two. It'll, it, it, the way it works is, it produces a hormone called auxin that moves down the branch by gravity and suppresses these from growing or growing very much. <coughs> kind of like the me first gene. Apples come from Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, in mixed woodland, deciduous forest, streamside, foothills of what a range of mountains called the Tian Shan or the Heavenly Mountains. Uh, so it's a shady situation. So it makes some evolutionary sense to get some branches growing up and capturing sunlight to make sugar to produce fruit. The apple tree in the wild is all about making a lot of fruit with a lot of seed, throwing the seed on the ground, perpetuating its kind. The lower flat branches will be a good evolutionary strategy to bear fruit. So this apical dominance is the highest bud will grow the most. So if I cut here, I'm confident. It almost always happens. This will grow the most and I'll just get some weak branching. If something is not <clears throat> what you want, you thin it out. So all that just to make it happen. So uh, I've got enough of a skip. Usually the first, the next half dozen or so buds down will break from dormancy. Because this is high in the tree, I'll get branches that are stronger than I would down here. I'll get a lead bud going up, and I'll form my second tier of branches. You, you see over there, there's a second weak tier like that. So that the way you form branches on your leader is the head, the leader. And then originally that was done down here at planting. Boom, one, two, six came. Never mind they didn't grow optimally. Uh, we've got them growing more than optimally now. But this is really a good response. So it's the, the cuts, thinning cut. When you don't want a branch, you cut it out summer or winter. There should be no regrowth. You cut it out at its point of origin or to the collar, which helps it to heal and callus. Uh, heading cuts is a broad category. The heading cut is cutting a branch back into one-year-old wood. Proportionally, the more you cut, the stronger the growth. <clears throat> Secondary, tertiary effect from heading, lateral branches that bear fruit and a stiffening or strengthening of the branch. Shortening cut, where I want a branch that's filled its allotted space. Go down here. It's coming out into the alley. I'm walking down. So I'm going to bring it back a little bit. I'll just make a shortening cut to here. I cut slightly into older wood. It stops growth. The growth is shunted into the fruit buds that have developed here. Uh, renewal cut. Not going to do it, but it's going to a stub and it regrows. The reasons are what? To get a optimal exposure of branches up and out to sunlight, to capture sunlight for the purpose of photosynthesis, the excess carbohydrates, principally sugars, after the tree structure is made, make fruit. Um, and then you need to have a form, a geometry that honors light by allowing infiltration of light to the bottom and the center of the tree. You need 50, 80 percent direct sunlight striking all portions of the tree to manufacture and maintain fruit. So you train them to these forms. The leader and the open center are two standard forms used the world around. The leader is a little more complicated, but it's oh, yeah, exactly not brain right. surgery. <laughs> And uh, the open center is elegantly simple. They both work well. They both have issues. Let's look on this tree here. One year old grows only vegetative bud. So accepted like it's in the terminal bud. It's going there. Fruit bud, 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 fruit bud. So every one of these could become in time. In time, it's not only possible, but likely. That's why you always kind of need to keep a little vegetative growth going. It's a balancing act. Now when I say fruit bud, there will be a fruit bud subtended by leaves, so it's not going to be bare. Either. 
this one strong enough to leave? To leave? Um, it's weak compared to food. I had trouble with this line here, you can see. So, uh, feel low in me. I am re choosing to rescaffold this tree, and it's all your fault, Pat. Because you noted know, one little branch was weak. But, but really. Uh, hi, my name is Orrin. I'm a waxer. I'm going to uh, rescaffold this tree. You, I could advance the rationale. Yeah, there was a lot of fruit wood here. But I really wasn't feeling. Look how much space I got to fill here. Could I do that? Which we looked out there to these two trees. In three years, I'll have. I'll be back in fruiting again, and I'll have what would justify the space allotment here. So, uh, one, two, three, four, five ovules. What did we learn? It's a weak scion. What do you do? Put it on a stronger rootstock. Put it half, uh, twice as close together, or twice the density. Grow the heck out of it. You got to really lean on it with water and nitrogen in the early years. But again, it's filling space. If these trees were on three foot centers, I wouldn't have done that. But they're on nine foot centers or ten foot centers. So I'm just like that. So, no, I mean, it's stuff you do. Um, leader or open center? Well, if you took out the middle, it could be. Leader, I'm going to leave it. One, that branch will grow the lateral simultaneously internally at each of these buds it'll form next year's flower it's called a flower primordia the tree goes dormant drops sleeves in the winter comes out of dormancy in spring summer too each of those buds will be a flower that can bear a peach but i wouldn't care about one two peaches there maybe three but probably one two like that life is Good. I'm eating peaches. In year three, each of those fruit bud dies out, and I have no fruit. So the fruit buds on peaches and nectarines, and they are exactly the same. A nectarine simply lacks the fuzz gene, and they're as old as one another. They've been grown. They're from Western China, uh, even though their Latin name is Prunus persica. You have to be constantly renewing your lateral fruit. Wood. So this is a young tree that doesn't have a lot of laterals. So let's let's use this as a peach branch. Send you guys 30 bucks. You don't have to come on the tree. This is the peach branch. Uh, they grow one year, fruit one year, and die. So the pattern of pruning, um, it's very formulaic or temp template-like. On uh, laterals on peaches and nectarines is. You leave one and you stub one. You leave one and you stub one. You leave one and you stub one. Very formulaic <laughs> type of line. The one you leave, you fruit. The one you stub will regrow and fruit next year. Next winter, I stub the one I grew this summer. So you could say, what I'm eating this year, I grew last year. What I grew last year, I'm eating this year. So again, you have your lead branches and everything with heading and thinning is the same. You're Laterals are your fruit-bearing surface uh, in order to keep renewing fruit wood because fruit buds only bear for one year and then die. You stub one, you leave one, you stub one, you leave one. It's just absolutely fun. It's also the easiest, most template-like pruning I know. Why or fork a couple times. Here, single this, a little less. Uh, Really? <laughs> Skip that for a minute. Uh, and to wire for it. Yes or no? no? What did you do with the last one? Yes. Too, too many things. I got the cognitive the dissonance literally. Uh, let's do this and we'll go back. Uh, so you're going to fork this one because you singled that one. I singled it, yeah. Uh, why not? I thought you forked that, that one too. So I would single that one. But you didn't, you said? Locked it. No, I think it's not. <laughs> uh, and uh, maybe not, huh? Uh, I gotta go back over there. Uh, um, so these are the cuts I would make. What's the issue? What are the issues with these two branches? I mean, let me tell you, they're not punk, but they're not as vigorous and upright. And by virtue, one of the reasons they're not as vigorous is because they're not because they're flatter. 
So when you have a branch, it's still it's acceptable, and I've got space to fill here. So you, I'm gonna cut it back a lot. That doesn't break the rule. I'm gonna cut it back to an upward facing bud. Directional. It will invigorate it more. See if I can direct them up here a little bit, train them out like that. So there you go. Let's look at a bigger Point tree. I, you know, I can get a few fruit. I'm just going to single this up here. I don't want it. If that grows, it'll shade too much. You need to limit the vigor and the extent of your top tier branches. So I limited one. Now. And I'm going to bring these along with some very slight stimulating cuts. Strengthen and lengthen in to get some more lateral fruit bearing surface here. And what do you think about this one? That it would be a little bit dangerous. I wish that I had this here, then I could cut the weakness and I'm ready. I'm gonna stop it there. It looks a little ungainly. And stop it here. And see if that'll work. You know, that's certainly strong. I have a lot of fruit bearing surface. A little ungainly, but if it can stay there, fine. If something tries to grow, I won't let it. And this, I'm going to do two things on. I'm going to actually train it into this space here, right? And I'm also going to slightly head it. So I kind of done, but I'm not quite done. I like a little strength and I like a little lateral framework. Oh, great. Look at this. You know what this is? This is an infection of ap rosy apple aphid. Sometimes it goes 360 loop de loop. It's a prominent aphid that bugs your as it work, uh, apples. It sucks into the underside of leaves and deforms them and they fall off the tree. It causes the leaf to curl like that, which is an ingenious thing because you can't get up there and spray or get the insect. It's hidden. Uh, and then it, they can puncture into young twig, which is succulent, and they disrupt the vascular flow, xylem and phloem, so you get this contorted growth. It'll never be strong again. Insecticide of choice with organic mm. growing. And the mode of action is just smothers and suffocates, and it's not harmful to other entities. And it's not what too late. Of, it's not goodness, too late. So good. What kind of oil? Is it? Uh, you can get any number of dormant oils. <laughs> Previously, it was a real light viscosity petroleum oil, but now there's soil oil, canola. Basically, most of the oils are sold as pruning winter dormant oils are either uh, non-GMO, organic, soy, uh, or cotton or canola. Based. I'm going to make a shortening cut on this one over here. I'm kind of done, and I really put it when putting a premium and not shading the base of the tree. Um, so I, I did stimulate one, two, three, and then I shortened a couple. I'm coming down here, as I said, you can have, on the skip, you can have a lot of little short things, but you can't let them go on endlessly. So I'm just going to we'll start to shade. So I, I, I like a little short fruit hangers in here, but I'm going to shorten these. And I can short. Uh, I, you know... For every fruit I get there, I'm going to shade two or three there. Let's thin this. i try to employ all the cuts quickly here. And when you're going like this, try to move up to a bigger tool. So that's my upper, the leader. Am I going to head it or not? I'm done. No. I'm going to leave it alone. Primary scaffold branches, a few I headed to bring along a little bit just lightly. A few that were too vigorous or had vigorous growth, I shortened slightly into two-year-old wood. Lower tier branches. Um, you know, these are long but strong and they're, they're fitting good. I'm not going to do any major alterations here. Actually, I did last year. This went up further and I cut to a short, weaker replacement and it didn't grow much. It's working good. I'm now going to work my way down the lateral framework and tell you this is how I would handle laterals on palm fruits, apples, and pears in the winter. And that is to say I will make no heading stimulating cuts. I will either thin or shorten. I just start. It's like fine, fine, fine. A little too long, but I can't prune it now, so I'm going to either leave it alone and summer <laughs> prune it or just thin it. Got plenty of others. So short, it's flat, it's beautiful and self managing. That's good enough. This has been summer pruned and stopped. <coughs> it's forming a fruit bud there. It's okay. Let's go down this side. This is good, but you don't want to keep. I'm just going to head out in one direction. Ideally, you would like your laterals to be perpendicular to your main arm here. Two, three, four, 
three fruit buds on that whole run there. This has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven here. Uh, Fiat Lux, let there be light on the lower, flatter, weaker. It's more productive. I'm thinning it. Uh, and you could make the argument that you thin this, but I'm going to just shorten it to this little fruit cluster and then thin this up right now. I'm just trying to, in a mini sense, rework this area to allow entry of light and uh, shorten overly long ladder. This is okay, but let's stop it there with a shortening cut. Stuff that goes below flat is not very productive. You thin it. Uh, stuff that's on the underside is not too productive. You thin it, shaded by the top part of the ring. This is long but strong, but maybe we just adjust it a little bit. I can live with that or even just shorten that a little bit. Let's not fork out here. Let's just stop it here. If every lateral was like this, we'd be done. Self-managing. <laughs> this is cute. This is pendant. When it, when it gets pendant, lost bigger. Let's do the other side here quickly. Lateral. Okay. How many? How long? What's spacing? What's their plane that they grow into? I'm okay over here. I'm going to send this out in this direction here. Keep that fruitful and lightful. Fruitful and lightful. Is that word? Uh, it is now. Then that, you know, it's not very productive for its upright run. You, all, you have two choices here. You always go with the weak and the flat. It starts to sound a little like the Statue of Liberty thing. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled, your masses. Weak and flat is strong. And then here I'll even take the weaker of the two. So I'm creating light in here. Not really interested in going back in that direction. Let's come out here and shorten this. So I'm only making thinning and shortening cuts. Fine. And Mondo, but fine. So, uh, but you know, again, it can be too much of a good thing. Let's shorten this a little bit. And then let's adjust some of the sublaterals as it were. It'll make them a little less long and allow late entry. Underside, you don't really like. Um, and I guess someone thought we could have a lateral branch that was a primary here in full space. All right. Uh, there's a ton of reasons why I don't really like that, but I'm going to allow that to exist. I'm done. What you do on one branch, if the tree is well grown and somewhat symmetrical and balanced and even, is more or less what you do on another one. So the pattern is you set leader. Assess the leader to prune or not to prune. I'm done. I'm not going to prune it. Assess, or actually this is the one that I re leader, right? Remember? Uh, but as I have it now, I'm, I'm fine. Assess your primary scaffold branches in the upper tier. They need to be lower in number and shorter than your bottom tier. So you would either very slightly stimulate them with a heading cut or shorten them. If there are too many, thin a few. If they are too long and starting to droop, you could renew them. Lower tier branches, assess your Primaries, do I want them to grow? Then head them, but usually in a situation like this, eight, ten years in, you're done, so you leave them alone. And then the rest of it devolves to dealing with your lateral framework. You either thin or shorten. You don't head on laterals on palm fruits in the winter. You can head in the summer and it stops growth. But come on like August the 18th or whatever we post it and we'll do summer pruning of these trees and you'll learn about that. That's kind of the basic run through. Let's do this tree here. More branching. And I'm not confident it'll happen. You can notch. And so what I'm going to do, I'm going to try to get some growth up here. Maybe it'll happen, maybe it won't from here. But to ensure that I have some more possibilities, I'm going to take a knife and I'm going to cut about halfway around the stem here. I've got to score into the conductive xylem and phloem to interrupt it without chopping the tree down. And then I just cut a little wedge or knot out, uh, a notch out. If I'm happy, I can make a smiling face. If I'm not so happy, a frowning face. It's rather unimportant. What's important is that you score it about halfway around and not damage the bud. And you need to have a big enough score so that it can't heal itself real easily. Okay, I do that there. And I do that. Wherever you need a branch, notch it. The principle is, as mentioned previously, the top bud produces a suppressing auxin, a hormone, that moves down by gravity and suppresses these buds from 
growing. What I've done here is I've interrupted that flow so a little more accumulates above rather than at the bud. And similarly, water and nutrients come from below and move to the tip of the branch, but a little more accumulates at this bud. There's about a 70 to 90% chance that I'll successfully grow a vigorous branch here from notching. What if a deer gets into someone's <laughs> orchard and they just eat the bejeebers out of something and maybe you've only got two branches sticking up? Can you come on the other side of that tree where the, what I would call a trunk and it may not be the right it's word. It's harder to do it in a trunk than into younger wood. Okay, so. But you could. You and could try it. is it done differently? No, it's the same thing. If you don't see a bud, just notch somewhere and sometimes you get a response. When you say if you don't see a bud, did you notch that? Because I couldn't see below a bud? Above a bud. Above the bud. Yeah, right, but they didn't quite express cut above that. If you don't see one, just make a score halfway around and make a notch, see what happens. Just a very debilitating. Uh, so, if I had a tree of this nature, you can see, I, I, I did all of this two years ago, and then last year, some renewal cut. I mean, we're talking honking renewal cuts here. But hey, that's cool. So I would come this year, and I'd say, oh, beautiful. Open center, here we go, two prongs, a Y, whack. And, and then head these. Well, you're gonna figure it that. I would say, hmm, the sick puppy here. Uh, it's the kill him or cure him technique. Let's stuff it down here, see what happens. We have something here we can grow up to make a shorter uh, open center. Maybe I'll try to invest in this and this and stimulate it, thin everything else off. And I would work my way around this tree in that fashion. What have we got other than a tangled mess? Mm. I mean, and you really don't have any, you don't have enough sunlight down the center. You don't even have leaves down here. It's bare wood down low, right? This is what, it's shaded, the top is shaded and you can't get at the top. You've got too many branches. Uh, we're wanting singular growth. I don't want any lateral distractions, so I'm not going to at the present time allow any head this up here like that. Got to position this like this and that. I got two two legs of my tree going here. Now I see it. Uh, I'm going to grab this and do the same thing. Head it hard. Train it out here. And I'll make more uh, rough cuts over here. But I've got so I got I can use this. Let's go that way. Open that center up, huh? Let's head it a bit. Go that way. Look for a bunch of opportunities, like as many as eight or ten like this, and then thin everything else. Or look for some like this, and then renew a few like that to grow some more of that. And then we're on our way. And... That's not a thinning cut, though. That's a renewal. Renewal. Cut. <laughs> okay, you kind of catch my Don't worry, on this one, like this one. Leave that, that. You have something that's damaged that. Leave it alone. I leave a stub, it's dead. You cut flush, it might invade the rest of the tree. Oh. Excited you brought me over here. <laughs> Didn't I say something like the best fertilizer is the footsteps of the bark? You go, you look, you see, you simulate, you act. Alright, thanks for coming by, folks.